So those of you who've been joining me in the lectures will know I have promised you a lecture supplement to help us catch up on some of the neuro content that got cut off at the end of one of our lecture theater recordings. And also in response to a bunch of questions that I've been receiving at the ends of lectures about what exactly the slides and what exactly the images in the textbook or in the neuro papers themselves are telling us about the relationship between the brain and cognitive psychology. On to the cognitive psychology. In lecture number seven, we were looking at knowledge and the construction of categories. One of the approaches that we saw in our lectures was the idea of a connectionist model of information processing. Now, the toy model we were looking at before is quite a small scale one that might not give you the complete picture. Um, often these connectionist models are much, much deeper and contain all sorts of internal structures that are designed to characterize the information in different ways. Another property that has been observed um, for computational models of this kind is what's known as graceful degradation. And the idea of graceful degradation is that if you impair the model's function in some way, if you cut some of those random uh, edges, some of those random links between different nodes, or if you impair the function of a node, um, they don't simply stop working completely, rather their performance degrades. Uh, it's not a catastrophic failure, but they do get worse at doing the jobs that that particular node or that particular edge was performing previously. We have uh, some patient data that you can uh, refer to in the textbook for a bit more detail. But when we look at neurological case studies in the, hit, in the history of psychology, they can tell us a lot about the kinds of emergent properties of a system that categorizes things. So it's been observed that more than one individual after suffering a brain injury uh, may show a very specific kind of deficit in their understanding of things. Now, in this case, we have two different patients who are both showing very good performance on non-animate but living things. And both of these patients show a deficit for living animals. So uh, these are patients who, if they were asked to identify an apple or a tree or a grass would do very well. But if they were asked to identify uh, a dog or a horse, they might struggle a lot with, to access that knowledge. So this suggests uh, across the board that functional organization of categories in the brain is both distributed in that it's spread among multiple resources um, and also domain specific. So you might have uh, regions in the brain that handle the animacy of living things, not just the category of animals. Uh, you might have regions in the brain that are coding for things like the functional properties of tools and objects. Uh, and you might lose your ability to understand object functions even though you understand very well the objects themselves. So that's what we mean by domain specific as well as distributed. So <laughs> that brings us to the end of our uh, brief neuro recap for the topic on knowledge and categories. Topic eight was imagery of all kinds. And we're going to dive straight into the neuro data this time. As a reminder, single unit recording is a way of getting a very, very, very fine microelectrode um, onto an actual neuron to be able to record changes in membrane potential that signal action potentials. So the data that we have seen in this module include single unit recording from uh, areas of the brain that are being used to represent different kinds of information. In this case, um, how does a particular neuron respond in the presence of a ball or the presence of a human face? 
Now, what's interesting in this example is that the participant was asked to look at pictures of a ball and a face and also to imagine a ball and a face. And what's interesting is when we look at the face signature, they're both very low um, fluctuations. Um, and I think I've mentioned before that in order to keep healthy and alive, neurons have a kind of a base firing rate that they must kind of continue to keep up to remain healthy and functional. So what we're seeing in that little wiggle is the base firing rate. For the two responses that we're looking at for the ball, what we're seeing is a very different kind of pattern, a very high peaking pattern for both perception and imagery. Now, the two are structurally different from one another in this one-off case, but it is interesting to note that the two of them together are much more different from the face response than they are from one another. So this is one way that we can think about this challenge of whether visual imagery shares some processing with actual vision itself, bearing in mind that we've already talked about uh, individual differences in the strength and prevalence of this kind of relationship. The next kind of data we're going to look at comes from functional MRI. So as a reminder, we're looking at the hemodynamic response. So that is the capillaries carrying the oxygenated blood to regions of the brain that have just been very active. And in this case, what we're looking at is a person who is lying in a scanner uh, and the data that we're looking at come from capillaries in the visual cortex. And a participant is shown a picture for some amount of time and then the picture is switched off and then they're asked to imagine the stimulus that they were looking at before and then the stimulus is switched off and then they are shown the stimulus again. What we can see is the visual cortex uh, in the occipital lobes at the back of the brain uh, is showing a lot of activation both in the condition where it is perceiving visual stimulation and imagining visual stimulation. It's not entirely identical, but there is an overlap in the kinds of activity patterns that we see. Continuing with functional MRI, uh, this time we're looking at slices of the brain. Uh, what we're seeing here is three different regions that are being uh, looked at for how much activity in a positive or negative direction there is uh, when a person is perceiving something relative to being at rest. And we can see that the skull size and the brain configuration in size is different in each. So this is a slice from here, here, and here. In the second slide, we can see what the pattern of activation looks like when someone is imagining a visual stimulus uh, relative to what the pattern looks like when they are at rest. And we can see that overall, there are quite a lot of similarities. So to help us understand a little bit more about similarities and differences, a subtraction method is used. And this time around, when we look at the differences between those two, we can see that in the frontal region, there's no difference. In the medial region, there's no difference. But way back at the back of the brain, the occipital region, where the visual cortex is, there are some subtle differences. So this is a, another source of evidence that, that while there are some similarities between the neural activity of perception and the neural activity of imagery, there are also some measurable differences between the patterns of activity for each of these two cognitive behaviours. The next technique we're going to be looking at is TMS. As a reminder, in transcranial magnetic stimulation, the magnet is put over the head and an electric current is passed through and this allows a temporary focal lesion-like effect to disrupt the normal function of neurons in a very targeted brain area. So in the next experiment we're going to look at, um, a region that is thought to be responsible for uh, visual decision making is going to be targeted and we're going to see the outcomes. So in this study, participants are given the task to decide which out of a series of bars um, in a grid is longer than the others. So what we can see on the right hand side is a little graph 
showing us how people do when uh, they have sham TMS applied. So that's transcranial magnetic stimulation at a, a region of the brain that is completely uninvolved in any of these tasks. So it sounds the same and it sort of feels the same, but shouldn't have the same functional outcomes. Uh, so now let's look at what happens when the visual processing areas of the brain are targeted. In both conditions, there is a notable slowdown when TMS is applied to the visual cortex. So what this is telling us is that the visual cortex is critically involved in both perception and imagery. So not only is it co-active, but some elements of the function of the visual cortex seem to be doing the same work in terms of um, having those neural resources available makes you better able to perform this task faster. With, once again, our usual caveat about individual differences and the idea that not everyone may uh, get the same kind of detriment from having TMS applied to their visual cortex. So for example, if you are one of those among us who has uh, experiences aphantasia, then you may not suffer any detriment to your decision-making process in the imagery condition, but while you may suffer it in the perception condition. We're going to look at a couple of case studies now that can help us think about how uh, large-scale disruption to areas in the visual cortex might change the way that visual processing or visual imagery uh, works for an individual. So in this first example, we are looking at a patient who was going to undergo a surgery to remove a part of her right occipital lobe in a life-saving procedure. So before the surgery, she was involved in some tasks that would help the uh, practitioners to evaluate uh, what were the outcomes of the surgery. So the participant was asked to imagine walking towards a horse and stops when the horse is about to spill outside and then makes an estimate of how far she is away from the horse. So we have an illustration here on the right of the two distances uh, before and after the surgery. And so after her surgery, she reported needing to stop a lot further away from the horse before the horse started to spill out of her visual field. And this was taken as, as an indication that her imagery space was a lot smaller after the surgical intervention than it had been beforehand. And almost, uh, it turns out, about the size that you would expect if she was only able to imagine with half her field of former vision. So this is another sign that the visual processing areas of the brain are very critically or heavily involved in the process of mental imagery, as well as in the process of perception, even if there are measurable differences in those two processes. The next example we're going to look at uh, is the phenomenon known as hemispatial neglect. Hemispatial neglect is a phenomenon that sometimes occurs when someone has suffered a stroke in their right hemisphere. Uh, so right hemisphere damage affects the left visual field. Now, it doesn't necessarily affect their vision, but it does affect their ability to pay attention to things that are in the right side of their visual space or in the right side of their imagined visual space. So, for example, if a person is asked to draw a clock or a schematic of a clock, from memory, they know that the face of the clock is round and they might have a routinized operation for drawing a circle. And they know that there are 12 numbers on a clock face, but these patients can struggle very, very, very much to pay attention to the left hand of the clock face. So they have to find some kind of solution to fit all of those numbers in on the right hand face of the clock. So this is another interesting consequence of how the brain supports 
uh, both category knowledge of how many um, numbers does a clock face have, and also uh, how we can pay attention to the visual space that we have in front of us uh, when we are doing something like uh, drawing a schematic of a clock or trying to eat our dinner and remembering to eat from both sides of the plate. We have two further case studies that give us a really interesting insight into vision and imagery together. Um, and these are the patients known as RM and CK who have different dysfunctions in their ability to access knowledge. So RM can draw accurate pictures of objects in front of him, but cannot draw accurate pictures of objects from memory. KC, on the other hand, has an inability to name pictures of objects, even his own drawings, even when they are in front of him, but can draw objects in very great detail from memory using imagery. So this is a classic case of double dissociation where one has an impairment in one thing and no impairment in the other, and the other person shows the exact opposite uh, pattern of impairment. So when we see a double dissociation, it strongly suggests that there is functional localization of these two different functions and that one person has an impairment in one and the other person has an impairment in the other, but for each of them, the other location is unimpaired. So taking all of these different uh, sources of data together, we now have a perspective that perception and imagery are working together in some way in the visual cortex. And although their functions may not be identical, there is a shared location that has some shared function for those of us who have visual imagery. Topic number nine was language. So we're going to look at some of the neuroscience methods that can be helpful in understanding uh, the relationship of the brain in processing language. And we're going to be looking at some specific studies that have investigated language in this way. So first of all, I'm going to remind us of those two patient brains we saw earlier from Broca. And what we're looking at here is lesion data. That is what parts of the brain are damaged for people who may exhibit while they are alive, certain functional disruptions. So Broca's investigation of these two cases, followed by his colleague Wernicke, have led to the broca wernicke geschwinder model of language processing in the brain. Now, there are more up-to-date models than this one, but this is a really great one to get started on, uh, where we know that we have two regions in the brain, and these two brain regions seem to show a double dissociation in the pattern of deficits that go along with people who've suffered damage in these areas. The second kind of evidence we're going to look at for language comes from EEG. So just as a reminder, the event-related potentials method takes the continuous signal, identifies time windows of interest relative to some event, takes those different segments, creates an average, a grand average across all uh, stimuli of a particular kind. And from this point onwards, we're able to investigate whether different categories or different types of stimuli have different outcomes. Every electrode on the head map that you can see in the bottom right hand side uh, has its own set of wiggles that have been uh, generated in exactly the way I've described. One of the most famous cognitive events in EEG is known as the N400. So N stands for negative, 400 stands for 400 milliseconds. The uh, electrical potentials that are recorded from the scalp tend to fluctuate in a more negative direction about 400 milliseconds after a person hears something that is quite unexpected. So the, the less expected something is, the more negative going this wave is. Uh, and in Kutas and Hilliard's uh, pioneering work in the 1980s, they established that the N400 is highly observable across, across a wide area in the scalp, uh, but tending more towards the back. If you're ever looking at an EEG map and you're trying to figure out which way the circular head is facing, 
the trick is to look for the little nose. And I will just point out, do watch out that uh, in the N400 literature, a lot of the authors publish the negative going wave in the upward direction rather than the downward direction. So that's what we're looking at here. So the close probability is sometimes used as a measurement of unexpectedness. The close probability is something you've probably done in your high school classes for language at some stage, where a teacher may have asked you to guess the word that goes in the gap. And we'll see some examples of that in a moment. Uh, so in this case, we see that uh, having a very unexpected word, the blue one, and, and or a word that cannot go in the sentence in the way that it's been uh, delivered, produce more negativity compared to the other conditions. Uh, in studies that look at category membership, if you are looking at uh, sorry, if you are listening to the names of category members and perhaps making some decision about whether or not they belong to the same category, when you encounter uh, related items that don't go or unrelated items that don't go, the unrelated don't go items are the most n 400 y compared to the other conditions. Expected items, however, have the least negative going potential. Uh, we've already looked at some examples of priming in our class and in per paired word studies, we also see in 400s when two words are unassociated and the example here that we've used before is a word like library preceding a word like nurse, uh, we get a very n 400 e response, a very negative at 400 milliseconds response, as compared to conditions where something is weakly associated or strongly associated, like the example of doctor nurse. If we take this, this back to our thinking about the hierarchical nature of language, where we have phonemes that can be combined in different ways to create different morphemes that can be combined in different ways, um, to make words in the lexicon, which can be combined in different ways to make different uh, structural units in language, different sentences using syntax, then the N400 seems to be operating mostly at the level of the lexicon. If we see a different kind of violation, so in this case, we have a comparison between uh, a scenario where we hear um, the cats won't eat or the cats won't bake, which is an unexpected word in the context of that sentence. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we encounter an N400. On the right-hand side, we have a contrast between the cats won't eat and the cats won't eating, which the meaning of the word is fine, but in this context, in this sentence, the grammar doesn't align with what we expect. So, What's interesting here is we see a different kind of effect. It's not negative and it's not at 400 milliseconds. This is a P positive 600. The graphs are still upside down. Though. In addition to that, we sometimes see earlier effects of unexpected content. So in this case, we're looking at phonology. We're looking at whether the sounds in a word are the ones that you're expecting to hear or not. And this is sometimes referred to as a phonological mismatch negativity or PMN. It has a couple of different names in the field. So if we bring these different kinds of violation of expectation together, then we get a fairly consistent pattern. We could have an example like they sat together without saying a single word, which is highly expected. Compared to that, if we have something very phonologically similar, so we're expecting to hear the sounds, but meaningfully incongruent, that's when we see the N400. If we have something that violates our expectations for the sounds and the meanings, then we're likely to get both a PMN or a sometimes called an N200 and an N400 together. By contrast, if we have something that uh, satisfies the phonetics, satisfies mostly the wordiness, but does not satisfy the grammar, that's when we would expect to see a P600.
To bring that back to our model of the hierarchical organization of language, we can see that we get something called a, a phonological mismatch around 200 milliseconds, mismatches in the lexicon around 400 milliseconds, and mismatches of syntax around 600 milliseconds. Now, we've already talked about the idea that this might represent bottom up processing of language from the auditory source. But because there's expectation involved, it also has to involve top down knowledge about what's likely in this context in order for us to be surprised by what we hear next. So this is an interactive uh, account of uh, language processing in time. Topic number 10 was on problem solving and creativity. The first method we're going to look at is electroencephalography again. The first example we have of this is applied to participants who are wearing the hat while they are undertaking different kinds of problem solving. Uh, and what Kunios and uh, their team have established is when people indicate that they have solved a problem, you can look backwards in time to what their brain state was like just before they came up with the solution. And this gives us an indication of what the neurons in different parts of the brain are doing uh, while the solution is forming. So they've established that just before solving an insight problem, there is a change in the activity state for the front right hand scalp region and just before solving a, a non-insight problem they instead see activity at the back on the right hand side. This is a, a an indication that at least as far as the the problem solver is concerned they seem to be utilizing different neurological resources in the solution. We're going to look at MRI again next. So this time around, we're going to look at what's known about the default mode network before we get into study data. If you are invited to participate in a study and you're in the scanner, and for certain periods of the, your time in the scanner, you're asked to pay intense attention to particular kinds of stimulation. And then in between times, you're asked to just chill out. So it's thought that during those downtime times, uh, there's an opportunity for mind wandering and potentially some kind of ideas incubation because you're not tied up with a task that you're doing on demand. So if we do uh, diffusion tensor imaging of these particular re brain regions to look at where their fiber pathways lead to, uh, we actually get a pattern that looks like this. So this is just to remind us that when we see uh, parts of the brain that are active in different areas, uh, it really helps us to understand whether or not there are super information superhighways between them. So in this slide, we can see a functional MRI of participants performing a creativity task in an MRI. Uh, so this is the alternative uses task that we have played together in class. So coming up with an unexpected way to use uh, an everyday object uh, and especially one that nobody else has ever thought of. And what we can see in this scan is that there is a, a region of activity, the anterior cingulate cortex, that correlates quite highly with originality scores. So remember, when we were looking at the default mode network, we have this frontal bright spot. Uh, and then when we look at this creativity task, we're also seeing activity right towards the front of the brain in a very similar region. So this study helps to show that maybe that prefrontal cortex region, and in particular, the uh, anterior cingulate cortex may be responsible for the imaginative side of the alternative uses task, just as it is responsible for our mind wandering. So we're sort of seeing hints that the default mode network is active in this kind of task. In this study, uh, participants are involved 
in one of these cyclical processes where first of all they generate a large number of ideas and then they evaluate and refine from among their options so the question might emerge are these two processes being done by the same brain region or different brain regions so what we can see at the top is a representation of the activity pattern that is observed when generating ideas creates more signal than evaluating. Now at the side, I've just put in a little reminder of where these slices are coming from. It's not anatomically accurate, but just so that we're aware that all five slices are from the same data set, they're from the same group of participants, but they're cutting through at different heights in the skull and we can tell that because the skulls are different sizes and the brain looks tissue looks different at different levels in the brain uh, below we can see the opposite pattern we can see which of the brain regions that are active are more for evaluating decisions than for generating and what's evident from this visualization which is a uh, even just to the untrained eye, is that the patterns of blotches are different for generating and evaluating uh, creative ideas. Given that baseline, we're now going to look at a functional connectivity analysis. And just as a reminder, we're not going to correlate every part of the brain with every other part of the brain. Instead, we're going to seed our analysis at the part of the brain that is most interesting to us. So if we focus on the evaluation side of the equation, the little gold star indicates uh, the regions of interest that are going to be used as seeds. So the regions were selected on the basis of the outcome of the previous slide that I just showed you. So the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is uh, used as the seed. And the question we are asking in the top row of data represented here, the question we are asking is what other brain regions show strong co-activation when the dorsal anterior cingular cortex is firing? And the answer is there's a lot of activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. So we saw before that bushy branching structure in the tractography, right? So one region in this cluster uh, is triggering a lot of activity through that whole prefrontal cortex region. But in particular, the medial prefrontal cortex. The second seed is in the lower half of the image. And this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, is being used as the seed. And again, we're asking the question when this region is active during the evaluate phase of the task, what other regions are also co-active? And in this instance, the authors report uh, strong co-activation at the posterior cingulate cortex, again, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the temporoparietal junction. So, this is taken as evidence that it's the executive network that is co-active with the default mode network that we saw earlier. So is executive network being the decision-making one, default mode network being the creative, free-thinking, brainstorming one. When the executive network uh, is more active, the default mode network is also more active. And this can be taken as a sign that our decision-making and our creativity are intricately linked together. Lecture topic 11 was on decision-making. And the method we're going to be focusing on is functional MRI, which is detecting, once again, the hemodynamic response, that is the oxygenated blood permeating areas of the brain that have recently been active. So the task in question is the ultimatum game. Now we played the ultimatum game in class under uh, three different conditions. One uh, where we imagined having $10, one where we imagined having $100, and one where we imagined having $100 but maybe playing against a member of our social network. Um, in this particular study, participants were not playing against their own mothers. They were playing against another human 
or so they thought, or they were playing against a computer. The ultimatum game is a two player game. One person is given $10 and instructed that they can split it with the other player. The other player has the right of refusal though, which means if the player with the money offers to split uh, only a very small amount with their partner, then the partner may refuse the deal and everybody walks away with no money. What's interesting in Western cultures when people play this game is uh, people are very happy to accept their offers at $5, the even split. But when the numerical quantity deviates much more than that, people start to behave uh, in very different ways as though they are punishing a bad agent for offering them a bad deal. So as we can see from the data in front of us, people often reject low offers because they are unfair, uh, but people are more willing to accept even low offers if they believe that their playing partner is actually just a random computer. The next question that we can ask to follow up on this is what brain regions are involved in these decisions? So what we're gonna be looking at in this slide is only the data from human partner games, and the data have been separated into fair decisions, which is the 50-50 split, and all of the other decisions are uh, classified as unfair. So one player may choose to reject or accept uh, an unfair offer. So when people are in the scanner making these decisions, uh, if we make a comparison between fair and unfair decisions, and once again, we just have two different slices at different depths in the skull side by side. Uh, we can see two different regions that show more activation for unfair offers than for fair offers. So we can see activation in the insula and we can see activation in the prefrontal cortex. Now, up on the top right, we can see a little scatter plot. And what's interesting on the scatter plot is if you look at the level of activity in the insula, which is mapped on the y axis, and you look at the uh, acceptance rates on x, what proportion of the unfair trials did a person accept the money, you can see that for people who had more activity in the insula, they accepted less of the offers. So this is telling us that when you have more activity in the insula, you are more likely to reject. And the insula is a known emotion processing center. So more insula activity, more likely to reject. This must be involved in that annoyance that people feel when they think an offer is unfair. And the graph down below maps that out quite nicely. When you look at the anterior insula, the front part of the insula, you can see a large difference in insula activity between those occasions where a decision was accepted versus rejected. But if you look at that other region that was very strongly active, the prefrontal cortex, you can see that the activity was equivalent regardless of whether the, um, the bid was accepted or rejected. So remember the prefrontal cortex, is part of our uh, executive control system, and it's involved in all sorts of decision-making. One way we can think about this is tie it into uh, our system one and system two, or uh, processing type one and processing type two that we've seen uh, earlier on in the semester. So we know that system one is fast and automatic and intuitive. Uh, we also know that it's prone to stereotypes and bias. And we can now link that together with the idea that maybe when our emotions are triggered, our insula is active and those emotions can guide our ultimate uh, decision making processes. By contrast, system two uh, is slower, more deliberative, more conscious, and it can implement all sorts of strategies and checks in its decision making. Uh, and we can think of maybe the prefrontal cortex as doing more of the heavy lifting on this side, because uh, 
the prefrontal cortex is involved in making those decisions regardless of whether they are accept or reject, whereas the emotional content makes it more likely that we will reject an offer when the insula is more active than not. So taken together, uh, these neural perspectives can help us think in new ways about similarities and differences in cognitive processing of uh, decisions, emotions, language, creativity, imagery, categories, and all sorts of aspects of your day-to-day -day functioning as well. Thanks for joining us.